Hey there, it's Anna here on 89.5 The Wave, and I have the honor and privilege to introduce you to Erica Schroeder. Now, you may know Erica's voice, or if you don't, you may know her by a different name, which we will talk about. She has been in many things. She's been in Pokemon. She's been in Yu-Gi-Oh! She's been in One Piece. This woman is amazing. She is such a big influence, at least to me, in the anime world and voiceover. And I am very privileged to have her with me today. Erica, thank you so much again. Of course. Thanks for having me, Anna. <laughs> so, I again, thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy day. And as I mentioned, you go under a different name at times for certain animes. Correct. That's correct. Yes, I had a... Uh... Um, an alias of Bella Hudson. Um, if you'd be interested in knowing the origin of that alias, I can tell you. Oh, I would. Please, please do. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever been asked that before, but basically I was working theatrically and with, you know, on camera and also in VO, and my agents had sort of suggested I use a different name. I don't know why, but I was like, sure, it sounds like a great idea. And um, I came up with the name Bella Hudson because my sister's name is Danielle. Oh, no and kidding. And I call her Daniela. Yeah, I call her Daniela Bella. Oh. I've always called her that. She's a, we're only 15 months apart, and she's older than me. And I love her very much. And then um, at the time that, this, that my career was, you know, really taking off and starting, um, she had her firstborn, her daughter, and she named her Hudson after the Hudson River, um, which we grew up near and loved and canoed on and um, did lots of amazing things around. So I chose that name as an homage, put together, you know, honoring my sister and her daughter. And so that became Bella Hudson. And then years later, I was like, it's also a racehorse. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Which is very funny. Yeah. That is adorable. Oh, my gosh. That story is so cute. <laughs> now, I did mention in your little introduction that you are known for being in Yu-Gi-Oh!, being in Pokemon, and also this is, uh, she's also known for being in Sonic. If you were growing up in the middle of the road time for Sonic around uh, 06 and, um, and other games. So you, Erica, are known for uh, Akiza from Yu-Gi-Oh!, Blaze the Cat, Emma Frost in... Astonishing X-Men, I, I got to ask, what is it like to be known for these strong female characters, to be this big influence for these, frankly, spunky characters? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, it's great. It's awesome. I mean, it's wonderful that people are writing strong women characters, and it's wonderful to be asked to portray them. And it's also interesting to play characters that challenge authority, characters that challenge, you know, um, ways that, you know, women are supposed to be or not supposed to be, and also women that are morally ambiguous, too. I mean, Emma Frost, you know? <laughs> what exactly are her motivations um, all the time? And when is she a good guy? When is she not? And so I, I love characters that are, have multi-layers to them. I mean, Akiza had a lot of layers to her as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I love playing strong female characters. And maybe if we have time later on in the interview, we can talk about a strong um, female character that I'm portraying currently. Ooh, um, foreshadowing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, so you're known for all these strong women, these strong characters, not just women. You play, you do play a couple of strong male characters as well, which we may or may not get into, into later in the uh, interview. But are there roles that you personally like that are maybe less well-known to the public? Um, there's always roles like that. You know what I mean? Ones that you love and, um, and people often associate you with a certain sound or a certain character, a certain voice. Um, but I love to transform. I'm like, I don't know, if I were to compare myself to someone on film, it would be like Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's oh! Like, or like that him? I'm not sure. Or Gary Oldman. Um, and my favorite thing to do is to transform. You know, um, there's a couple of us in New York um, that are known for that, and therefore we do a lot of walla, you know, extra work on a lot of shows where they'll come ask you to come in for an hour and play like six people. You know, boom, boom, boom. Um, I love doing work like that. I love transforming. So I love playing like zombies and 
and you know creatures. I love playing creatures. I play a lot of creatures and different things, video games and things like that. Um, so one of the characters that I love to play that is like that um, was Squonk from season seven of Winx Club, um, which was just so cute. He was uh, Aisha's fairy animal, Aww. and um, yeah, and I just love to portray him. He's just adorable, and um, I love the the character description. He gets so emotional, his eyes well up with tears, and then he cries like fountains of tears that can fill up a whole room and, like, drown people if you don't open the door. Oh, my gosh. But he's just a fun <laughs> character to play, and I, I love the voice. And um, I also enjoyed playing, this was, like, way back in the day, but um, Hildegard Valentine in... Um, Oh, my gosh, I'm forgetting the name of the video game. But anyhow, we'll have to insert that later. Shadow Hearts for the New World, I think. There you um, go. And she was like three different characters within that. So she got to transform. There was She had different forms of herself. Um, so I enjoyed kind of finding the different sides of her. I thought that was an interesting concept. And then I, I love to play older women. I love to play um, evil, evil women. <laughs> so um, it's just fun i mean why why not right and um so there was a character called the witch from an animated film um a russian film that was beautifully done beautifully animated um called little long nose and that's one of my favorite roles i've ever, I've ever done and i don't know that a lot of people have seen it occasionally i'll bring the dvd to a a um convention if and just show people uh, little clips from it just because it's such an interesting Piece. And, I, and I really enjoyed playing that role. Yeah, great question. <laughs> Thank you. So if you had to pick a creature or a character that you maybe haven't portrayed, what kind of a creature would you like to try? Gosh, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of an animal. I mean, because Pokemon are in, all inspired by animals. So it's funny because, like, oftentimes if there's a new bird Pokemon, they will be like, Erica, you will play this new bird Pokemon. Aww. Because... I'm known for playing birds, um, and they're all based on, you know, if you do great impersonation of, of the real animal, if you can portray the real animal, you know, you might get, you know, handed a beautiful role. Uh, sometimes you have to audition for them, and sometimes they're handed to you, depending on um, how big the role is and things like that. As far as what I haven't played that I want to portray as a creature, um, a creature that doesn't speak. I don't know if they ever did like a new video game of the Gremlins. Ooh, that would be very exciting! <laughs> you could um, pull off a very yeah. evil, like mischievous Gremlin from from your work. Okay, you just—you almost that. gave me a heart attack there. Spoke a little bit, even. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Oh my gosh! So, speaking of Pokemon, you know. How is it voicing po um, the Pokemon you do? The several bird Pokemon, the uh, all kinds of, frankly, adorable Pokemon, as opposed to some of the human characters you've done, like Nurse Joy, uh, Kenny, Bianca, uh, Steven Land, all these uh, characters, and then you have, like, 20, 30-plus Pokemon under your belt. I mean, what what is the, the feeling, the differences between doing those types of characters? Um, that's an interesting question. It, it is very different. It's very different. Um, and then it's also the same. The, the thing that's the same about it is you're, you are portraying an intention. You are portraying words. Um, people don't know this, but um, we know what the Pokemon is saying. If we don't know exactly what they're saying, we know the feeling that they're feeling. And the, um, but it's almost like you give yourself words. Um, you know, if Pancham is saying, I love you, he only has the words pension to say that, but I know that's what I'm saying when I'm actually voicing it. Um, so it's actually, I think some people think they, that you're just randomly pulling the, the, the voice or something from different things, but we actually go through the entire script from beginning to end, cue to cue, moment to moment, and fill in what that Pokemon is, is expressing at that moment. And it's really fun and freeing because... Uh, I can. I don't have to look at the script if I don't want to because the director, um, you know, currently Lisa Ortiz, who's awesome. We, we love. Oh my gosh! Her, really? Um, will just guide me through, like you know, moment to moment of what's happening. And so, if I want to look at the script and see also what is written there, I can. And if she wants to just guide me through the episode, um, 
you know, through way through her eyes, and you know, and through her looking at the script, we can do that too. Plus, what we see on the screen is also, you know, another piece of information that you have to, of course, take into account in a big way um, in terms of flap, the flap of the character. That's the character's movement of their mouth. Some Pokemon, were, you know, you're more about the flap, and some it's like, who cares, you know? In the original <laughs> language, in Japanese, they frequently do not pay attention to the flap at all. In fact, I mean, actually, I should say it's prelay there, so it's done, it's, it's recorded first and then um, animated after. So, but interestingly enough, the animators don't pay attention to what the actor did. They just kind of do their own thing. Um, but in the English language, we're more cognizant of that usually, and we're more, um, we try and be a little bit more true to it. But there are, there are characters that you can be more free with the, with the flap, and then the flap doesn't really matter. It's kind of a instance by instance kind of thing. And as far as playing the human characters, I mean, they're a blast. Um, and sometimes I do t I take a moment to like warm up into speaking English um, after I've just done like you know a bunch of sounds for <laughs> for a long period of time. <laughs> but um, Bianca was a ridiculous amount of fun. I loved her. Um, she's so quirky and hyper and energetic and bizarre, and and I see myself that way in a lot of ways. Um, Aww. I don't. Well, I don't need to. You know fit in. What I don't ever want to do is make someone feel uncomfortable. That is something I do not like to do. But at the same regard, um, I don't need to be, you know, enter a room and feel like I belong there. You know, I don't always feel like I belong there. Um, sometimes it takes me a while in a big group of people. But, um, but I try to just be true to myself. And I think that's Bianca. She's just happy-go-lucky and, and true to herself. And sometimes just a little strange. Hey, strange so, is a good um, thing. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever wants to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Certainly not why we've become actors. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of those uh, energetic, excitable, and, you know, maybe a little grumpy at times character, is there a character that you have portrayed, uh, aside from the witch, which you did mention earlier, that you per uh, personally maybe related to or just like to play in general? Um, definitely, yes, definitely Bianca, um, definitely relate to her. I related to Luffy a lot too, actually, because I am really goofy. Um, my sense of humor is really goofy. Um, I, not to say that I don't love wit. I love a witty person, <laughs> but I'm not acerbic and I'm not dark and I'm not, um, trying to humiliate anyone at any point in time. I'm pretty much what you see is what you get. Um, I love being joyful. I love being adventurous. Uh, and I feel like that's a lot of what Luffy is about, too. And just laughing. I love to laugh. And I love to have a great time and explore and enjoy myself. So in his sense of humor, it was very much in line with mine in that way that um, a lot of the characters I per portrayed on stage as well are, are um, bigger or larger than life um, characters. Extreme, I like to make extreme choices um, when I can, when it's appropriate in that piece. You know, every piece that you're given is completely different. Different producer, different director, different writer, um, different tone, different energy, different, um, the character has a different background, different emotional life, and, and every piece has its own personal style, and you have to walk in there and be willing to just let go have an idea, have a very specific idea, but if need be, let go of that idea um, and go with, you know, the direction that you're given and go in that um, headspace of the energy of that piece, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, definitely it does. I like to go on tangents, just so you know. I'm oh, tangents are <laughs> fine. We've got all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of Luffy, um, how do you prepare for a, a male role like Luffy? I mean, you say it's pretty easy to get into his character because you can relate a lot to him. But is it any different than slipping into uh, Bianca or Kenny or any other characters? It's, it's similar in a lot of ways. The only ways that are different, and it's, and it's interesting because you can sort of interpret that, like break that question down in a lot of different ways, whereas like... How do you discover being male 
you know, the first time that you try that out, you know, oh, I'm male today. What does that mean? How does that feel? Um, it's always going to be different for each character, but you do have to put your headspace in the mental head, in the, um, your, your mental headspace in, I'm, I'm, I'm male, I'm thinking male, um, coming from a different point of view. Then you have to figure out how to adjust the voice accordingly. Um, and everyone has different ways they do it. Um, there's a lot of different things I think about when I'm creating the voice of a young boy or a boy in general. Uh, one of them is texture. It doesn't necessarily mean if you put texture on a voice, it automatically becomes male. Because I could be an older woman anytime I want, and I'm putting texture on my voice. But it's a different <laughs> kind. You know, it's a totally different transformation. You know, and then there's also characters like, um, you know, Bart Simpson that are male characters that have no texture at all. And she's just doing it, you know, based on kind of like, uh, it's the attitude of the boy behind it. And she's also forcing the voice more forward. That's really good. Um, and not putting breath on it. She's taking away the breath. I tell people sometimes when they're trying to do it, I'm like, sometimes if you're playing a character that's really forward and very loud and there has a lot of tone, you're actually holding your breath more. You're not releasing the air. Whereas if I'm playing somebody like Nurse Joy, I'm going to be like, I'm going to have a lot of breath on there because that's important. So, yeah, so first you figure out how I become male. How, how, does, how does my voice do that? How do I do it mentally? And then as far as um, preparing, it's just sort of something that I can, you know, flip in and out of quite easily. As far as longevity, <laughs> um, with playing characters like that and doing them for a long period of time, uh, over an extended period of time, like a few years, but also in the booth for three hours at a time and maintaining that voice, not dropping it, and also not losing the voice, that's a process when you're first starting because it's a muscle. It's a muscle. You're, you're using a different muscle. You're using a different part of your voice, and it's, you're going to feel it. You're going to feel a little bit of wear and tear. You're going to feel a little bit of pain. shouldn't feel feeling too much pain, but if you do, you have to self-check. You know, and understand why am I feeling this pain? How do I ma make it less? Um, and how do I not damage my cords? And that's a learning process for every voice actor, for every actor um, in general. How do I go to the extreme without hurting myself? And I, over the years, have developed a couple of different things to self-check. Um, but one of them is to never, 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 never. <laughs> it's so important. Don't ever take ibuprofen or any sort of painkiller. Um, whether you have a sore wrist or an arm or anything, never take it before you go in the recording booth because it thins the blood and therefore makes you more susceptible to uh, vocal damage called like a varix or a burst blood vessel in your throat. Um, it makes you more vulnerable to that for that reason, and it makes you more vulnerable because you can't feel your limit. If you can't feel pain... You can't feel your limit. There's some superhero like that. I can't think of who it is. Superman, but, um, Kryptonite. So I say never take never take um, pain medicine before you're going to work. If you do have some sort of issue with pain, you take it after, um, and that actually will help your cords not you know swell as much. And then the other trick I've learned um, is to slide up and down the scale, um, musical scale between cues, not between every cue, because she would drive the uh, director in the end. <laughs> but every, <laughs> every couple of cues, I'll go, hmm, hey, hmm, and I'll make sure that I can get as, as l the least amount of air on my cords as possible. I can connect them in the right way. First of all, I'm relaxing them. I'm smoothing them out. And if I'm still, if I, there's breaks in the voice, like, mm, mm, you know, that kind of stuff. Then you're like, you know, I really should stop now. Um, <laughs> it's not always an option <laughs> because you may be scheduled for three and a half and you're kind of like done at two and a half. Two and a, um, <laughs> two and a half. But um, there's ways to self-check and to self-preserve and make sure you, you don't go overboard. But, um, so, yes, yeah, that was like the second half of the question of <laughs> how to prepare for a male character, how to maintain a male character. So with any... It's like with any muscle, any workout, anything that you have to make sure you don't go over your limit, especially if it's your first time, you could damage 
in this case, your vocal cords, whatever part of your body, I hope it's your vocal cords, that you're do using to portray that character, you want to make sure you don't overdo it. That's what you're saying. Yeah, you have to just be careful because you can permanently damage your, your cords. You know, um, people like Julie Andrews, you know, she had to have surgery. So, yeah, you have to take it seriously, your vocal health. You have to take your vocal health very seriously. Um, this is a funny story, if we have time. Um, sure, go ahead. <laughs> I was doing a show, a musical called Shout, Shout the Mod Musical. Oh. And I had my third, my second callback for the show. Maybe my third. I can't remember. Um, the day after, or the day, I think the day after my last record for Luffy, um, and I screamed a lot. I mean, everybody knows I yelled a lot. I mean, because he yelled a lot. And um, <laughs> that was a vocally strenuous role. And I was singing um, Shirley, the Shirley Bassey song from um, Goldfinger. Ooh, nice. And it was a 1960s review of uh, English women. Um, and there's a cast recording of it that's really funny. But we got to the last note in the audition. I had to learn the song and sing it for everybody. It was like a panel of people behind the table, maybe eight of them. And when I got to the last note, I went, he loves God. And this voice that came out was like, Luffy. Oh, no. <laughs> it was just like, God. You know, it was like hysterically funny to me. But they're all thinking, that is so strange. Like, what, <laughs> what is she doing? You know, and I finished singing it. And I go, hey, I'm really sorry. I, it was kind of like my cartoon character that came out there. You know, I just finished the last um, record yesterday. But, you know, in about a month or so, that will go away. But vocally, that's where he yelled, like that's right in his belt zone. It's the same as this, in this role in this song. And they were, you know, hysterical. They thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. Um, that, you know, I suddenly went from Shirley Bassey to, to Monkey D. Lucy <laughs> in the audition. And thankfully they appreciated it and they, they believed me and hired me anyway. So um, just a funny story. That is hilarious. <laughs> So, <laughs> you were <laughs> ridiculous, but hilarious. So, you were yeah. saying that it can be difficult to portray in male characters in doing different vocal ranges and doing the voices, but this may be in a different scale. How were there really any roles that were difficult for you to play, or maybe even you were not so sure about the character? You read over the description and went, "I'm not sure I can do this." Maybe. Maybe you've got the wrong person. Did you ever did you ever have feelings like that? I I'm not sure. Sometimes that happens when I'm looking through audition sides. You know, I might choose not to audition for a particular role. Um, I tell people though, for the most part, you should try everything. You know, try everything. Don't limit yourself before you've even tried. Um, I did have a like a little bit of not difficulty, but it was more challenging with Blaze, actually. Really? Um, yeah, because, and I think it, it really worked in my favor because it made her more dimensional, more dimensional than she could have been, more three-dimensional, because uh, there were more than one person in the room, there was more than one person in the room giving me direction. That's a difficult thing to do. That happens a lot in the commercial world, you know, if I'm doing a commercial voiceover, you know, I may end up, especially if it's a demo, you know, it's at the design, like the advertising studio. They have recording studios and there might be like 12 people who worked on the campaign and they're all giving you notes. Um, you have to be able to take everything they're telling you, interpret it, consolidate it, and give them everything they're asking for back. So that happened with Blaze. I wasn't frustrated. It was more like this is challenging. Like one person saying, I need her to be like this, and another person saying, I need this layer. And occasionally they conflicted, you know? And I'd have to say, either ask for clarification or say, can I do both of these? Can this character feel both of these things? Can this character have, um, I'm not saying her in particular, but, you know, ultra femininity and at the same time be punky and, and, you know, asexual at times, you know, like you, you have to sort of 
take everything they're saying and, you know, give them what they're asking for. And most of the time, it does make the character more three-dimensional. And occasionally, it's just, you know, there are times when it's bad. <laughs> with the, with the, there are times when the term too many cooks in the kitchen mm-hmm. is actually true. And, um, but you have to hold it together. You have to keep it together and, um, and give them what they want, you know? You have to try and compromise oh. without... Ma- yeah, yes. Ma- you have to compromise to make the dish right without making it too sweet, too spicy, or too bleh. Exactly. Very, <laughs> very good uh, yeah, parallel there. It's Thank like, you. Yeah, I mean, half of being an actor is, is um, pleasing your director, you know, giving them what they want. The vision of the show, it's not always about... You. I mean, oftentimes it's not. It's it's really you have to check your ego at the door every time you walk in. <laughs> I have I have heard <laughs> and if that you before. Don't check your ego at the door. You're not going to work that much. <laughs> That's nope. the truth. So, having to deal with the uh, demands of directors, with their vision might not be the same as yours, or maybe having fun like you had with uh, that you have with Lisa Ortiz. Have there been any funny instances when you've been recording? There's always funny instances. There's like every single day I'm in the booth, something, you know, silly happens or, you know, we go too far or uh, you say something accidentally the wrong way. Uh, There's so many great stories um, over the years trying to pull out like specific instances. Outtakes are always fun. I am the queen of outtakes. Um, It depends on who I'm working with. There's this guy. Uh, this engineer that was at 4Kids, who's uh, now at 4K, he stayed, um, Joe Shalek, but everybody calls him Vegas. Joe oh, my Vegas, gosh. Because <laughs> um, he likes to gamble, and he's just a lot of fun. <laughs> but um, Joe is hilarious. Joe is constantly recording you. Even when you don't think you're being recorded, he's recording you. So if you, you know, mess up and you're like, D-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-
It is. It's a joy to be able to hear different actors tell their stories, to hear the relationships that they have with not only their directors, but fellow voice actors. Which brings me to another yeah. question that you partially answered, but we'll go on with it, you know. Uh, sure. What You know, uh, how have you formed any close relationships with your fellow voice actors during a project or at a convention? You know, you've said uh, Lisa Ortez, who's director and also a voice actress, but are there any others that stick out to your mind who maybe have worked with you in the past or in the present? I have a ridiculous amount of friends from working with people over the last 15, 16 years. Um, I love Dan Green. He's a dear friend. Um, Wayne Grayson is awesome. Mark Thompson. Um... Greg Abbey, uh, we love to work together, all of us. Eric Stewart, um, some other, you know, female voice actresses. Casey Rogers is the biggest sweetheart in the world. And I think we both felt good about the fact that I was going to be taking over for her when she retired. Um, she actually plays my grandma. She played my grandmother um, in... Um, as Astoria Rapunzel in Regal Academy. Ooh. So someone had to take over for her for that. But then I took over for Casey for Wabafet on Pokemon. Um, and it was cool because I, like, I actually remember like messaging her on Facebook and like asking her a question about it, like her too, you know? And she was totally open to it. And like she knew somebody was going to take over and, and she gave me my, her blessing and it was cool. So yeah, I love Casey. She's like, oh my God, so sweet. And Allison Rosenfeld um, is not new, but newer in my world. And she is um, incredibly talented, very versatile, super sweet, super savvy, um, and also a stage and uh, actor and a singer like myself. So um, we have that in common. So that's just maybe the last year or two we've become friends, you know, um, not just colleagues. And then people that I've met at conventions, I've met so many uh, awesome people people that I really hit it off with, like immediately, Liesl Wilkerson, um, Jessica Calvello. She is a hoot and a half. She's a ridiculous amount of fun. Um, so funny, so irreverent, so, oh my gosh, spontaneous. It just says whatever she wants, whenever <laughs> she wants. Not ever in a hurtful way. Just like not really worried about, you know, what anybody's thinking about what she says and it's this beautiful thing and and with that spirit that she has also she's exudes a lot of love and a lot of like positive energy and so I love her and I met the Ayers brothers uh, at a convention with uh, Greg Ayers good friend Gareth West and the, the Greg and Gareth and I were inseparable the whole weekend you know, that's awesome the three of us were a posse and that was fun <laughs> Anna and Chris was amazing too so I mean just I, I don't know if I mentioned Darren yeah I mentioned Darren Dunson tons of friends and I really enjoy being part of the community and I think that most people you know 95 percent of the people that I work with are just uh, beautiful people that's so adorable <laughs> So between those voice actors... And you're welcome oh, to ask about anyone specifically, you know? Oh, I wouldn't want to get the dirt on anybody. <laughs> oh, no, I, wouldn't, I would never give dirt. That's <laughs> not me, not in my nature. But I can give, I can give gold, the gold of the person. The gold. I do like the gold. Or maybe a quirk. A oh, quirk. a quirk. Right. What would be a quirk? Ooh. Uh, now, I have a lot of friends... Darren likes to say totes all the time <laughs> in the booth. Totes. I mean, totally. That's... Oh, my gosh. That's adorable. So let's see. He likes to say that. Now, what's another quirk of... Now, I have a couple of friends that are big fans of Eric Stewart. Now, do you know any quirks, you know, about him that might, you know, get get a laugh? Oh, Eric is funny. Is Oh, my God. He is so funny because he likes to... I think some people don't understand when he's joking. Like, he very often will become Kaiba, you know, from Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh-huh. And Kaiba is like so egotistical and yep. so egocentric. <laughs> now, Eric has a very healthy self-esteem, but he's not a he's, he's not a jerk like I, but you know what I mean? <laughs> he's just a really super confident guy and um and it's like really admirable, but when you first meet him, like even when I first met him and started working with him, like I thought of him as like Kaiba? Uh, I don't know, like he I was a little intimidated by him at first. 
I was like, because he, he, he does exude such confidence, um, in, you know, not cockiness, but just like totally 100% comfortable with himself in every way, which is such an amazing thing to be and, 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 and exude, you know. Um, so, no, Eric is hysterical because he, he sometimes will, like, you know, do an interview as Kaiba or act like Kaiba on the Internet, you know, and sometimes people might think, my gosh, like he's so full of himself, but he's just taking on the characters of, of his that people love, um, like James too. And, um, and he's hysterically funny in an interview. Oh my gosh. Um, and he has the best outtake I've ever heard in my life. Really? Can, can um, you spill? There was, I, I can't tell you exactly what it was, but it was a promo. Okay. And it was like one of those things, like W G M V T L A P. It was like a like he was talking about some radio station that had like twenty initials. <laughs> it was <laughs> absurd, and he's really good, you know. So he'll he usually get something in one or two takes, but he could not get it. So it was like a series of outtakes of him trying to get it, and then at the very end of it, he was getting louder and louder and louder, <laughs> and then he just started shouting it, and then he went. Go bleep yourself at the very end. Oh, oh my gosh. Like, and it was just one of the funniest outtakes I've ever heard in my life. Because he was just like, you know, how dare you ask me to say this thing that is <laughs> impossible to say. But um, he got it. <laughs> Eventually. Uh, eventually. <laughs> yeah. So you've been to a decent amount of conventions from what I've seen, and you've been hanging out with your fellow voice actors. And I assume you've met quite a bit of fans. Your Facebook page is very popular with you meeting tons of people dressing up as your characters, especially Dark Magician Girl. So I got to (laughs) ask, what's the strangest gift you've received from from a fan at a convention? The strangest. Or maybe sweetest if there's nothing strange or odd. Oh, no, no. Uh, The... The, the probably the strangest gift <laughs> it was really quite funny and flattering um it was these two guys um and i only remember the one that gave it to me but he had like a, a gent that was with him um i remember him because he was wearing a, a like really tight white unitard that was rather see-through oh and um <laughs> and i was thinking one must wear undergarments when wearing white see-through <laughs> unitards. But anyhow, um, he was very funny, and he 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 proposed to me uh, with a like a ring from like a candy machine, like a vending machine. Aww. <laughs> and his friend asked if he could video it. So I've always wondered if it was going to show up somewhere. I don't know, maybe it is somewhere. But it was a very funny proposal. And I don't. I think he proposed to me like as a particular character of mine. I don't remember. And so he gave me a ring and put it on my finger. So that was a fun, quirky gift from a fan. Um, and I always get, like, gorgeous artwork. And I'm so amazed at the effort and the time and, and, and the love that some of the fans, you know, the time they take to make these things and then to try and figure out how to get it to me. And um, and I'm always humbled by that and just so flattered. And, you know, it just gives me a, a warm, fuzzy feeling. A cool feeling. Yeah. <laughs> so, would you consider that maybe, uh, I, I guess, a cute thing? A good, maybe even a, a good luck charm. Like, do you have any good luck charms that you take with you, or even rituals when you go into the booth? Like, is there anything maybe that you've gotten from your family that you treasure to have in the booth when you do a character? You know, a lot of people have things like that. I think. I think a lot of people have something or. Um, something they want to bring with them or something they do right before. Um, I don't really have anything in terms of a ritual or anything that I always do. Um, for stage performances, I will tell you, I do have a ritual. Um, and that is I must have chamomile tea with honey in it. Oh, that's sweet. As I warm up. I need that. Um, as far as, like, rituals in the booth, um, I like to be physical. Like, I like to... Um, so if it's a ritual that if my character's punching someone or my character's being knocked out or whatever, I am as physical as I possibly can <laughs> emulate what's going on on the screen or, you know, and it's funny because you can't wear noisy clothing. You have to wear, you know, cotton. You can't, there's 
certain things that you might wear in the booth, like a necklace or bangly, um, you know, bangle bracelets or a leather jacket that you're like, why did I wear this today? Or something <laughs> with a zipper on it. Um, and you learn pretty quick, you know, if you're going to be one of those people who's moving around a lot in the booth that you have to be wearing like 100% cotton all over the place. Um, so yeah, my ritual, I guess I would say is kind of just being physical, taking on the physical life of the character because it informs me. That is awesome. I could totally visualize you doing that. Just, you know, Give Mark it a- Thompson does that too. Like he is the most notorious for it. Like he is hysterically funny to watch. Between the two of you, who do you think puts up, puts up a better fight for the characters? <laughs> I don't know. Mark is pretty committed. Like he, you know, um, Lisa actually was directing some zombie thing project that we both. I, I played all the female zombies, and he played all the male zombies. We you know, had an audition for it um, for a amusement park ride somewhere Ooh. in Las Vegas. And I'm like, I have got to go to Vegas again just so I can get on this zombie amusement park ride <laughs> somewhere in some, you know, building somewhere. But no, he's um, he's notorious for that too, in a good way, of course. Good way, of course. <laughs> yeah. So I have one more little thing for you, or should I say major thing? Of course, thing. yeah. I have, I have plenty of time. I don't have a heart out today. Okay, that's, so that's you, good. No. Need a few more minutes, we can do that. All right. Uh, you've mentioned Lisa Ortez. You've mentioned Wayne Grace, and you've mentioned Eric Stewart, and you've mentioned Dan Green, among many other people that are a part of this grand project. What can you tell us about Crossing the Gods? Ooh. I can tell you a few things. Um, I can tell you, like, a little bit about my my character. Um, obviously, I can't tell you any plot points. Oh, darn. But um, I definitely can talk about it. Um, um, Dan did give me permission to talk about it. That is awesome. I thought it might come up in the interview today. Um, And the first thing is, you know, it stands for Guardians of Dimensional Stability. Ooh. I am not one of them. I am not one of them. You're not? Um, I think I mentioned earlier that Emma Frost was morally ambiguous. Also, my character of Delmenea is also morally ambiguous. Ooh. Um, she has um, a, a difficult history. Uh, what's amazing is all these characters have, like, super intricate history, just like an, an anime, a successful anime would, or, like, a successful universe like Marvel or DC. Um, Dan has written this in... Every detail you can imagine is is available to us, which is amazing because that is not always the case. So these characters are extremely complex, extremely layered, um, and, and therefore very exciting to play. But um, my character's real name is Serafima Vasiliev, and she's from the Soviet Union, Ooh. and she's from, um, from Russia. And um, what can I tell you about her? Well, I think first I should say... I think I might, I definitely was the first one to record. Um, I'm not finished yet. I have another session in a week or two. But um, I think maybe a couple people have recorded since I, since I did. So it was exciting, he and I, to, to discover the script the first time together. Um, and I'm just trying to think of what I can tell you about her. Um, she's, she's trying to, basically she has, you know, many objectives, many, you know, bigger story arcs and desires, but she's, she's trying to find out, um, you know, if an extremely powerful device uh, rumored to exist is actually real, and if so, where, where it is. And so a lot of the crux and a lot of the um, drama and a lot of the conflict within it is about, is about that, um, not just for her, but for, for every character. And um, what she wants with it, you know, is a complete mystery. And I don't know if it will be revealed in it or not, but um, yeah. It, and also, it's I know I can tell you this: it's going to be released episodically. I don't know how many episodes it will end up being broken down into, but it's about a hundred-minute piece. Wow! And um, yeah, it's 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 amazing. I mean, I read every character's description, which was lengthy and you know um, detailed. And then I got to read about the whole universe, and you know, then I got to read the entire script first. And I know that seems like, oh yeah, you know, but it's 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 actually unique. 
um, you don't always get all of that information. You don't e- always get to, like, delve that deep and to understand everything. Um, thankfully, this is a prelay, you know, meaning we're recording it first and then they're doing that after. But it, um, I'm trying to describe the, uh, the style of it. But everyone should definitely go to the Facebook page and check it out and watch the trailer because that will give you, you know, a better idea. But it is a, it's an illustrated audio drama. So it's not an animation. And it's not, you know, a podcast either. It's like a, it's like a radio play with, um, you know, images to help facilitate. So it's not even a stop motion comic. It's something very unique, and um, it, you know, it might be the, you know, one of a kind at this point. Um, what they're doing with it, and um, Dan is actually drawing everything himself, which is incredible. I don't even know how he's doing all of that and, you know, finding all the time, but um, but he is, and thus far the work that he's done on is pretty incredible. But she has special powers, I can tell you that. You know, she has different forms of telekinesis. She can create fire. She can intrude people's minds. Ooh. Um, yeah, and she can burrow into their worst fears, and that's one of her strongest powers. It's I'm not getting shivers. Power, but she's very manipulative, and... Um, she loves to expose people's weaknesses and, and then get them that way. Um, so yeah, it's pretty dark. <laughs> it's it's pretty dark, and uh, it, it, it's similar to working in a, in a superhero in a superhero's journey story. Um, I can liken it to that. So yeah, I mean that's one of the things that I'm that I've been working on that I'm really excited about. I mean I'm completely hooked. I've watched the trailer more times than I can count. And oh, you cool. telling us about your character. Yeah, and I get scenes with everybody. I think I have a scene with at least every single character. I think I have, my character has more of a relationship with um, Eric Stewart's character. Ooh. Um, we're closely linked in a certain way, um, Blacksmith. And then I do also have, um, you know, my son is Jason Griffith. Ooh. He plays um, Sykes, my son. So I have, um, there's, Oh, a lot of, um, I don't want to say too much, but the, the, of course. the relationship is interesting. But, um, yeah, so, but I do get to see, have scenes with everybody. I get to have a scene with Praying Mantis, you know, Lisa Ortiz's character. Um, who I find that character fascinating. Um, I want things for her. You know, when you discover her story, you will want things for her. But, yeah, there's a lot of amazing, and but what's interesting is I know all of these actors, like, Really, really, really well, except for um, Tara Sands. <laughs> like, really? Somehow, the universe never brought us together. Isn't that crazy? I guess it was waiting until now for this amazing project. Yeah, I mean, we've worked on so many things together, but we never crossed physical paths, which is insane to me. But, I mean, she left you know, to go to L.A. earlier than others. But... Um, but yeah, I do, actually don't really know her. I just know of her and how how much everybody and you know loves her and stuff. So I have to ask one little minor question about this. What was your initial reaction, if you don't mind sharing, when uh, Dan Green or Eric Stewart or anybody brought this up to you, saying, "Could you? Would you be a part of this project?" What was your initial thoughts? Hell yeah. <laughs> That works. I, mean, I was excited. I was screaming internally. Yes. Um, no, it was like, uh, what a great opportunity to work with people you love and that you, you know, it's it's really funny because it's like, um, it's there's like character morphs within them. You know, like Jason and I are going to have this completely different relationship in this, and we're like Sonic and Blaze, um, Luffy and Usopp. You know, when Lisa and I are together, it's like we're praying Mantis and Dominia, but we're also Blaze. And Amy and Luffy and Chopper and and you know I'm just trying to think Eric you know it's like Kaiba and Mai that's rock and that's scary story. yeah I mean we all have so many amazing character overlaps and specific relationships and in, in other things um like I think Dan and Greg have both played my husband many times <laughs> <laughs> an insane amount of times um. But yeah, I mean, we have we have a lot of history together, and you know, it's not like the theater where you get to know people immediately right away and in kind of intense way. 
because we work together over a long period of time, crossing paths here and there. You know, we weren't always working on prelays together where you're in the, in the booth together. Um, when, when we worked on Turtles and things like that and Viva Pinata, yes, you work um, with other actors in the booth, and so you get to experience that and you have that camaraderie. But otherwise, it just happened with, like, parties they would throw every once in a while. You know, oh, my gosh, you play that character? How cool. Or passing each other in the hallway or one of them ends up directing you, or um, so we all kind of met each other and developed our friendships and relationships over a di- you know a longer period of time, and and in a way that's kind of cool because you don't burn out too fast. You know, some people, you know, when they get too intense too soon, they kind of burn out. But you know, all of us have maintained not not everybody. I'm sure there's some conflict here and there, but most everybody really likes everyone and in, enjoys each other's company and especially this group of people, you know, we all respect each other and care about each other very much, you know. I don't get to see Veronica much because she's on the West Coast, and I I always loved, like, running into her, so I miss that. But occasionally I'll see her at a convention, and that's always nice. That is so precious, and you have been so amazing to share all this with us, Erica. Thank you so much again. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me, and I wish you the best of luck. You're you're such a great communicator. Everybody has to know, like, what an amazing communicator you have been via email with me. Um, Thank you for responding back. And, yeah. So I have to maybe ask one tiny little thing. I know I've been doing that, and I'm probably annoying you. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> um, would you mind doing that little voice drop we talked about earlier? Oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah. How many do you, do you want more than one? Uh, whatever you're willing to give me. You have been amazing, and I am to your whim. Whatever you'd like to do, Miss Erica. Okay. All right. Let me try, let me try um, one or two. Do you want Isabella Hudson in there as well, or just Erica Schroeder? Oh, why not both? Why not? <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe I'll throw it in one of those. Okay, let's try it. Here we go. This is Erica Schroeder, a.k.a. Bella Hudson, voice of Emma Frost, and you're listening to 89.5 The Wave. I try to do it like a radio DJ for you. I like that. That was (laughs) smooth and spunky at the same time. (laughs) All right, let let me try one with Blaze, maybe. Does that sound good? Yep, that sounds good to me. Okay. All right. This is Erica Schroeder, voice of Blaze the Cat, and you're listening to 89.5 The Wave, yeah! Oh my gosh, that was adorable, Erica, thank you! <laughs> that was totally cheesy, I hope everybody loves it. Oh, cheesy's, cheesy's what we are around here, we, we can be a little cheesy, but I mean, what <laughs> DJ isn't? Thank you so much again, Erica, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule, we've been working on this for a little while now to could get this out to oh, you over and... a month right with our schedules yeah, oh, yeah um, schedule you're complex. welcome thanks for having me and all the best of luck to everyone there thank you very much erica you have been awesome and amazing and just this will definitely go up and i will be tagging out both your social medias because seriously if you can talk to this woman on her social medias she is awesome she is adorable and she is an amazing voice actress, and an amazing person. So thank you, Erica. Oh, thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. (laughs) Take care. You too, Erica. Thank you.